Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the University of New England Center for Global Humanities for our final lecture of the academic year. My name is Josh Behagan, and I'm filling in tonight for my friend, our founding director, Anwar Majid, whom most of you know. Anwar is overseas right now, but um, I, I know he's with us, with us in thought and spirit. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Barry Costa Pierce, who will present a lecture titled, How Climate Change is Reshaping Maine's Ocean Economy. Barry is one of our brightest lights uh, here at UNE and also in his field. Uh, we're very lucky to have him leading UNE's marine science program. He is the Henry L. and Grace Darty Professor of Marine Sciences, the Chair of the Department of Marine Sciences and Director of the UNE Marine Science Center, one of UNE's centers for excellence. Barry is widely sought after as a global expert in fisheries, aquaculture, and sustainable seafoods, and is a pioneer in the field of ecological aquaculture. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Barry Costa Pierce. Good evening. It's an absolute delight to be with you tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank Vice President Anwar Majid for this opportunity. Uh, the Assistant Director Liz and Josh for, for the time to be with you tonight. So tonight is about, uh, you hear so many gloom and doom stories about our planet. Uh, tonight is going to be a love story. It's going to be a love story of this planet which is ever changing and those who have studied it and can tell you a little bit about the rapid changes that are ongoing. I spent a lifetime working in the tropics, uh, lived in Africa and Indonesia as a research scientist. And when I was a younger man, I spent time in Greenland and in the Arctic. And so now I've returned. I've returned uh, to the roots of northern New England. I've ret returned to my research interests in the Arctic. And what I'd like to do is give you a tour about this love story. This planet has been changing for millions of years and we're changing again. And that, those changes are going to be unequally spread throughout the world. We know about that. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. There's going to be some amazing changes that will be tremendous opportunities for some of us. Uh, I think Maine is going to be one of those places that is going to be at the forefront, the front door of a lot of these opportunities. And tonight I hope to tell you why. I also like to, tell you a little bit about some of the people that are making these changes possible and how Maine now is becoming not the back door to America, but really the front door to the Arctic. And the changes in the Arctic will affect every single country uh, and every future person who lives on this planet. Okay, so you may have seen this, you may have not, but this was an article that was written in Foreign Policy magazine a number of years ago by a graduate student at Stanford University, Mia. Mia. Caught my attention because it talked about the phenomenal changes in Maine's, potential changes in Maine's economy. And how uh, looking north, rather than sort of looking as we traditionally do to Boston uh, and the New York, New Jersey corridor for our economic future, may present some really, really interesting new challenges. And when we really think about it, the social ecology of Maine might be more aligned to looking towards our northern neighbors uh, than we really thought about. So the most rapidly changing place on the planet is not only the high Arctic, but the peri-Arctic seas surrounding the ice cap. And that's where I'm going to focus most of my talk tonight, is on these peri-Arctic seas, the changes that the many nations are involved in, uh, and the mixed interdisciplinarity that's going on. In other words, you cannot just be a scientist anymore. You have to be involved in the law of the sea, in policy, in all of the legal, regulatory, and other what we call the human dimensions of the coast. So as a scientist, I have to crosswalk with social scientists, with economists, every single day. And let's also talk about the indigenous people. The indigenous people control most of this territory on the planet. And so we have to talk about with anthropologists and with indigenous nations in this area. And it's a great opportunity for us. We've done it as a planet before. We signed the Montreal Protocol to 
decrease the amount of ozone that was going to destroy the ozone layers. We've, we can do it again. We have the Antarctic Treaty. We can do it again with the Arctic. We can preserve and also sustain this incredible amount of new resources that is coming from this region. Okay, as a scientist, I'm gonna to present to you a few graphs, you'll have to excuse me, I can't get away from it. I can't get away from the science papers or a few graphs. But one of the things that we talk about now is that as a scientist, we've entered a new geological epoch. Those of you who studied geology, dinosaurs, the Miocene, the Eocene, the Precambrian, the Cambrian, okay? We all know about those, okay, and how the Earth has gone through changes that are so dramatic. They, there was the tropics the, in, in Antarctica, okay? We've seen tropical ecosystems in the far Canadian north. So the Earth has always gone through massive amounts of change, but this is new. This is the, a new geological epoch that many of us have anointed as scientists, the Anthropocene. The new geological epoch where human beings control the destiny of all of the biological, geological, chemical cycles on the planet, including evolution. We're part of this now. We may have been able to sort of 100 years ago, study our basic science, separate from humanity. You can't do it anymore. So human conditions, for many reasons, the Earth is changing, OK? Yes, we've all heard about CO2. But that's not only the issue. The Earth is changing, and we have to accept that change. That change has been part of who we are in our past. It has shaped us as people. But this new geological epoch, there's now journals about it. There's now great interdisciplinary science about the Anthropocene. But what it means is not only to be afraid. It means that we have the destiny of this planet in our hands now. And we can turn it into a positive mode. OK, this is, an this is another driver. Not only is the planet changing, this really shook the scientific community. About 50 years ago, the UN population assessments, the United Nations population groups, they saw that human population was going to level off, that it was going to plateau. Now we know in our latest scientific summaries that we have, and this paper published in our top international journal, Science, by a large group of, of demographers and population scientists, that that's not going to happen that human population will continue to explode on this planet. And we will be faced with upwards of 12 billion people on this planet by 2050, or at least by 2100. That has enormous consequences. Most of these people are going to be based in Asia and in Africa. And so at least three quarters of them are going to be part of that uh, area of the world. So it's no longer back when, when I was young. We talked about you know, sort of thinking globally and acting locally. That's gone. It's all about acting globally, acting locally. So each one of us of the next generation of those young people in the audience, every issue that is of great concern of environmental scientists, I'm an oceanographer, ocean scientist, anybody having to do with the survival of, of the ecosystems of the planet. We know we have to act globally and act locally because a lot of our issues that are here locally, even in little southern Maine, also have iterations all over the world. We can act globally. Okay, so let's look at a little bit about what we're all facing and we know about. And, but let's get it a little bit in depth. This is the, the latest February of 2016. You know, we all, weather is not climate, but we all know, and it was projections of the best global models in the 1970s, that not only were we going to warm for many, many, many reasons, add them up, CO2, add up ozone, add up dust, add up an increased methane emissions, add them all up, 
and you've, you get warming. And that's what we're, we're dealing with. But that warming is not going to be present. It's going to be very variable everywhere, and it's not the same everywhere. And so the most rapidly warming places on the planet are the Arctic, are the high Arctic. And there's many, many reasons for that that I'll get into tonight. But this is what we experienced this year. Uh, what it means in the models back, go way back to the 70s, is not only is, are we warming, but we're getting a, like a, a vast amount of variability, huge amounts of variability uh, in the climate signals that we're facing. Okay, so there really from the science community, there really is no debate about this warming. And sort of to the science community now, it really is secondary if it's CO2 or not. It really is a whole mixture of warming signals. And they're not only from our models. This is 16 and counting. It's called the great hockey stick. And we basically haven't seen these kinds of temperatures, you know, at least for a few thousand years. Now, 16 is not only just our models, it's also our empirical. That's a fancy word, says, is a bunch of eyeballs out there looking at what's going on in the Arctic, and particularly in the Antarctic, I mean, all of the Arctic region, uh, the, so the, the, the cold regions of the world. So there's 16 models and counting. I mean, those of you in the audience, I mean, if we can debate about what type of, of, of warming is going on. For us as scientists, this is what we keep on saying, is that you throw them all together and we're warming. So this is the current area of the world which is of great, great concern to scientists. It's the area of permanent ice sheets. It's also an, an area which is opening up so quickly that the jurisdictions, the political jurisdictions are being discussed as we speak. Unfortunately, our country has decided not to sign the Law of the Sea Convention. That is a tremendous loss for our country because we care and have jurisdiction along the Alaska coast. But the discussion that's going on between Canada and Russia right now and where the boundaries are and why those boundaries are being demarcated does not include the United States because we are not a signatory to the Law of the Sea Convention. But know that people are talking about a shipping line that would enter, again, Asia, where most of the world's people will live and where most of the world's markets are, that will traverse this area as little as 50 years from now, maybe 100 years. OK, up in this area, the high Arctic, this is what it looks like in the summer. So uh, 20 years ago, it would have been completely iced over. But you see a, a science group out there of a number of our colleagues. And what they're studying is not only the decreased extent in the ice, which is obvious. It's been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking every summer. Every year, it appears to be that by the end of the summer period, we, we report a yet another record low decrease in the extent of the ice. But that's really not what the, us biologists have been looking at. What we've been looking at is the loss of the volume of ice. So in other words, the ice is getting thinner. And what we're seeing is lakes appearing on the ice. And we're seeing the ability of the sun to penetrate into, th through the ice, into the water underneath the ice like never before. Like we've never seen. The, that was dark. And now it's all lighting up. We're also seeing in the big ice sheets these things called moulins. There's giant ice rivers that are appearing in the ice and massive waterfalls that are diving down to the very bottom of the ice sheets, which are then lubricating the ice sheets and the ice sheets are moving. And this is all because of the transport, the currents have been changing, and the transport of northern to the north of massive amounts of tropical and warm waters from the Gulf Stream. OK, so this is probably, this is an, an, an alarmist uh, sort of pictorial diagram of, of Greenland. But the Greenland ice sheet, the largest island in the world, contains most of the world's fresh water. 
Uh, and it's disappearing. Uh, it's disappearing again because it's being undermined by warm water underneath it. If it does disappear, and it has disappeared in the past, then sea level will rise to extra extraordinary heights uh, and almost all of the coastal cities along uh, the coasts of the world will be flooded. So this is something that we want to avoid. We want to avoid this at all costs. The, the Greenland ice sheet would, would melt. Now, the most extraordinary thing for me as a biological oceanographer is this comment. Well, it was just published in Progress in Oceanography by a large scientific team. They were investigating the basal productivity underneath the ice as well as in these ponds. And they reported that the productivity in the high Arctic was higher than any other oceanic productivity in the world. That includes the great upwelling zones off of Peru. That includes the Benguela current off of, off of Africa. These are the great world's fisheries, the great sardine and, and, and small uh, uh, fisheries that are at the bottom of the food web that drive most of the world's fisheries. As biologically productive as any ocean ecosystem on the planet, this really shook everybody. Because what does it mean? And again, it's not a totally bad news story. It means that these fisheries or this ecosystem is opening up and presents hopefully new opportunities that we can sustain for people on the planet. OK, the other thing, because the currents are changing, in other words, if we think about the great heat engine of the, of the ocean world, the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream moves all with that hot water from the tropics. It's just right off of our coast as it starts migrating or wandering towards Maine, which it's starting to do. But it's pushing up heat into the high Arctic. So this is a recent summary from a paper in Science, and it's species invasions by half degree of latitude by 2050. And look at the red. So the Arctic is being invaded from the south by species that normally were in Maine, now they're in Nova Scotia, in Newfoundland. Species that are in Newfoundland, now they're in Greenland and moving further towards Iceland, et cetera. So we call this the southern invasion, or what has been called the Atlantification of the Arctic. The species that are in the Atlantic that normally were around here are moving into the Arctic. And if we go back further down, we're seeing we're sentinels. Marine scientists are sentinels along the coast. And what we're finding is blue crabs that have moved from the Chesapeake. No, they're not in Rhode Island anymore. They're being reported in Newfoundland. OK, so we're finding these species moving very, very rapidly up into the Arctic. And here's a, a, a stunning assessment by a large group of scientists, again, published in Fisheries Oceanography, one of the places that we read a lot. And it says, of their, the 12 of the 17 key fishery stocks had very, very high potential to move into the Arctic, or had potential to move into the Arctic. And I just bolded out two of them for you, cod and haddock. OK, so if you were to do a seafood preference assessment of New Englanders, you would find that New Englanders would eat cod and haddock above any other fish. And in indeed, some people think that New Englanders like haddock more than they like cod. But these two ground fish are our two, according to preference st studies that have been done of us, they're their two most pre uh, preferred fish. And go to harbor fish. Go to the markets all around New England. They're not unavailable. They're here. And if you've noticed, those of you who shop in some of our local markets, they're pretty inexpensive these days. So what's going on? We're having a totally different way of thinking about trade and about seafood science in general. So some of these other species, um, yes, they're going to move in. Snow crab is obviously a very high highly valuable economic species. You know, it's interesting, our friends in uh, Alaska over here, they're finding a lot less movement for many reasons through this area. Uh, and so we, 
We're talking to them a lot about what's going on in this invasion. But it's this invasion into this area is what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Here's Iceland down here, main way down here. It's the Barents Sea that's right in one of these peri-Arctic areas with, you can see that, the Norwegian island of Savbad, which is one uh, area that many marine scientists go to study this. So there it is, a little bit blown, blown up. You can see the geography is, is really fascinating. It's northern Norway, which borders right on Russia. Finland doesn't make it up to the ocean there. Uh, and it's mostly Norway, Norway and Russia that are sort of pay, paying a lot of attention to this. But the consequences for this massive resource base coming to the rest of the world are tremendous. And it's not only are we getting our seafood these days, are we getting it from wild capture, nets out in the ocean running around and killing fish, okay, or capturing fish. That's what many of us think about when we think about our seafood. But just remember, half of the seafood that Americans eat today is from culture, from aquaculture, or from farming. And so I'm going to talk about both of these in this particular area in the Barents Sea and how it affects Maine's marine economy and why us as marine scientists are very, very concerned about being part of this larger discussion and international cooperation and making sure our students are involved in it also. Okay, so when this assessment came out from the fisheries commissions, which somebody like me pays attention to, we look at the Food and Agriculture Organization's productions. We look at what, the, and particularly this commission, the Norwegian-Russian Fisheries Joint Commission, the allocations of cod and haddock that the Norwegian-Russian Fisheries Joint Commission issued for 2016, for this year, was 1.1 million metric tons. You could have knocked science, fishery scientists over with a feather because that was almost the size of the entire fisheries of the continent of Africa. And this has been happening in five years, 10 years. It was half of Europe's total production. So this was phenomenal. The stories that were coming from this area of the world were like this. I just gave you one. Let's read this together. This is April 19th. News in English from Norway. Norway's record cod catches fetching good prices. While Norway's oil and offshore industries battle for what is widely, widely believed to be a crisis, the seafood industry is booming. That's best illustrated by fishing boats berthing along Norway's coasts that have been so full of cod this season that they're pulling into harbors very low in the water. This is what we heard in the 1700s in New England when the Portuguese and, and, and Spanish and other English fishermen were here off of the New England coast. Fish up to the gunnels that was so loaded with big fish that they were low in the water. It's like a fairy tale. There are masses of fish in the water. It's just gorgeous. It's good to be in fishing now. So now while we're hearing, you know, that the Gulf of Maine cods in every, uh, are in desperate shape, where are all of these cod in haddock? Okay, so hold that one aside because I wanted you to understand the phenomenal changes that this area is going th through in capture fisheries or in wild caught fisheries, boats with nets that are in our mind as what seafood is, is all about. But what is also happening is salmon farming. Salmon farming at a level where, again, most Americans are getting their salmon from farms that are produced overseas. And one of the countries that is one of the largest salmon farming countries in the world is Norway. Now, salmon farming has come a long, long way since the, some of the environmental problems that you heard in the 70s and 80s. Indeed, some people now say, like the, the famous dean of the school, of the Bren School at the University of California, just made a statement that saying that 
salmon is a much better choice than any other terrestrial protein for its efficiency and its sustainability. There's a large global consensus now coming out saying that we've got to move towards sustainable farming of the ocean or we will not be able to meet consumer demand. Half of the salmon that Americans eat right now is not from the wild, it's from farms. And then the other thing is that if we were to eat all of our salmon from the wild fisheries of Alaska, it would only meet about half of America's consumption, six months of America's consumption. So we are a salmon crazy nation. We have been eating all wild salmon and farm salmon. It's been exponential increases in salmon production. But this is new. The Norwegians now, as you know, obviously, the global oil industry has been suffering. But there are massive amounts of infrastructure that Norway has and the massive amounts of money that they've put into their marine science institution, institutions and, and engineering companies have resulted in this, a remarkable alignment of industrial fish farming offshore using their very high technology coming from the oil industry. So this is way out there, way out, you know, offshore, can't even see it. It'd be like the oil platforms, Hibernia, way off the coast of Newfoundland. And then this is coming on board. The USS Enterprise, those of you who are marine people in the audience, is 342 meters long. This is a fish farming vessel. It's larger than the USS Enterprise. It can handle 30 feet waves, and the pens are 10 30 feet below the surface. So in other words, they're out of the high energy of the surface. It sails around northern waters, and in one crop can produce 2 million fish or 10,000 metric tons of salmon. OK, so you've got this amazing alignment of fish technology. Why fish? Norway earns, after oil, the second major income to that country's fish. Fish is the most widely traded commodity on the planet today. Americans don't eat much fish. We eat about 150 pounds of meat per year. We only eat about 15 pounds of seafood per year. But in Asia, it's completely the opposite. But even though we only eat 15 pounds, we're 300 million people. So we're the third largest importer of seafood in the world. So we have a stake in this also. And where's all this fish ending up? We'll talk about that in a second. So also, this now is this area, OK, we've, we've gone a little bit further down up north, up from the Gulf Stream waters, are wrapping around here. This is now a lot of this is ice free. And then just come right over the Norwegian border here. And you see this area of Russia and Murmus. This area right here, Ura Bay, a, a fabulous new Russian investment in farm salmon using similar Norwegian technologies. China has tripled its imports in farm salmon. You can get farm salmon in Thailand, in Korea. OK, so what does this mean for us? Well, I guess the most exciting thing coming into this is this is actually part of the route of the Ameskip shipping company, shipping line, that has decided to home port here in Portland. Home port is uh, their, their base of operations is in Reykjavik, Iceland. But you can see one of the lines that brings directly products from the region that I just talked about, from Russia, Tromsø, Norway, through Reykjavik, into Portland, Maine. So we're 300 million people. There are only a few up there. And our, we're the markets, OK? But that's not the full story. So come into the midst of this is a group that we had a privilege of seeing a couple last two trips to Iceland and pioneers of a group called the Iceland Ocean Cluster. 
Now, you may have heard about them. Their vision is very, very powerful. It says that in order to sort of sustain, so if we are going to destroy these resources again, okay, these resources are very, very precious. They have huge potential for sustaining millions of people. But if we gonna continue to do what we've done in the past is not to be able to put the legal regulatory or the vision in place to sustain these resources far into the future. So sustainability, what Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Brundtland said at the Rio Convention in 2002, she said, I'm done with talking about what it means or defining it. It's can we sustain our current level of resource use so that we, can, we don't deter the abilities of future generations, generations to sustain their needs. So now we've got this amazing new resource of fish, which by the way, talk to the seafood doctors, talk to the Harvard School of Public Health. They're seeing that these proteins from seafood are magic for human health and wellness. They're so magic that they're recommending that we don't eat meat in some cases for many different reasons. They're finding out Alzheimer's, every single human disease and obesity, every factor about young children of pregnant and young women should be eating high amounts of mega-3s. These are absolutely important to the future of this planet. So what the Iceland Ocean Cluster is saying to us, can we envision something? Can we envision that if we harvest a cod, can we use it all? 100% utilized. Because in, in a traditional cod, we throw half of it away. Do you know that in the, in the world, we throw away half of the world's fisheries? We throw away half of what we harvest. So their vision is, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna harvest a cod, we're gonna use, utilize 100% of it in just an amazing variety of new uses that could involve every single discipline in a university and most businesses in Maine. Their other vision is, can we do it for lobster? Can we use 100% of the lobster? Can we, pull, can we work together to do this? Okay, so this is what's coming in this direction. Booming peri-Arctic sea fisheries. Coming to a place near you, okay? Lots of issues here. Again, seafood is the most widely traded food commodity on the planet. Uh, lots of issues about global footprint, carbon footprint, things like that. Are we going to put this on trucks and are we going to be all jammed with, sea, with cod trucks on 95? Are we going to think about sustainable transportation along with that? So that's what gets somebody like me very excited is to be with brilliant transportation people who are thinking that through, thinking that through the carbon footprint, the life cycle analysis, and how can we sustain this extraordinary resource? And then I talked about this. So we got salmon and we got whitefish. So when you go to the Boston Seafood Show and you talk to all of these buyers there, Boston Seafood Show is held every year. There's $1 billion of business done a day at the Boston Seafood Show. And when, I, when we went there as scientists, we, we were so excited to learn that there was something, a terminology we had never heard called the whitefish market. And the whitefish market was cod and haddock and tilapia and catfish. And they kind of talked in that way. And what were the opportunity costs between the whitefish market? This one is totally distinct. It's the redfish market. It has very little competition from the whitefish market. So we need to be together with economists, policymakers. We need to talk about how this new production can be sustained over time. Okay, so what about a little bit about this amazing country of Iceland, who is our new partner? N Maine and, and Iceland now, our destinies in my mind, in the mind of some of the people in this audience, are tied, our destinies are tied together like never before. And there's this man, Thor Sigurdsson, Thor Sigurdsson, who, <laughs> who is a pioneer in bringing this idea to us in Maine. So along with Thor, We've 
begun to talk to each other, to get to know each other. So take away the ice in Iceland, and we're just about the same size as you guys. We're about the same size talking to our European partners about as Portugal. And we've got huge amounts of resources, and we're so similar to each other. S about 70 some percent of the total population of Iceland is in a small radius around Reykjavik. Similar in Maine, you must, a radius around Portland. And we have our cultures are very, very similar to this cross-talking about sustainability and the future of the next generation. So this is their vision about the COD. And to see this vision actually become reality is, is a sight to behold for someone like me. Because all of the human health and wellness products that come from this particular species are displayed. Uh, innovation and entrepreneurship is displayed right before your eyes. It breaks down every single boundary between medical programs, pharmacy programs, and marine science programs. Okay, from my perspective, I need to be talking to schools of pharmacy or schools of medicine and talking to seafood doctors. So think about this for the lobster, and people have started to think about bandages, et cetera. You may have heard about some of the new products coming out in the press. So I'd like to recognize Patrick Arnold, who is in the audience, uh, and the two presidents. This is really, to me, the future, is having an entrepreneur who runs the New England Ocean Cluster, President Daniel Ripich from the University of New England, and President Glenn Cummings from the University of Southern Maine, on the bridge of a, an Icelandic shipping vessel that at that month when we were up there, as we were walking down, you've heard from me that it's one direction, you know, we're, we're gonna get lots of cod and lots of salmon. And what was said as we were walking down that that month was the first time that Maine had earned more money on its exports than its imports. That's special to hear that. That now we have this relationship that is so deep that our, our, our academic institutions now are talking about how we can partner with Icelandic academic institutions in moving the next generation forwards and backwards. Okay, so I've talked a lot about that one direction. Let's talk about our home a little bit. Let's talk about what's going on in the Gulf of Maine and what we can give back to them. And this is a pretty stunning example, part of our research on something that the, the Brits call rock salmon. We know it as spiny dogfish. So the Gulf of Maine is going through lots and lots of changes right now. And one of the things that our physical oceanographer friends have been talking about is the wandering of these two major oceanic engines. The Labrador current brings down all that meltwater from the Arctic. And we know that the volume and the speed of that current have increased dramatically. The Gulf Stream is that giant heat engine which keeps, moves the tropical waters over to Europe and keeps Europe temperate. So they've both started to wander. And they're wandering for many, many reasons. The weather that we're seeing is tied very much to the atmospheric ocean system changes. With the massive amounts of melting that I've talked about, the Labrador current actually wandered in that direction of that arrow this year and has been wandering in that direction more frequently than we've ever seen before. So the coldest water on the planet this year was not way up here, it was somewhere here north of the Azores. And we've been seeing this happen. Warm core rings, wandering of the Gulf Stream into the Gulf of Maine like we've never seen before. Let me explain this one. This is the amount of Gulf Stream and Labrador current water that we've seen in the Gulf of Maine over the last few years, last 50 or so years. The blue is the Gulf Stream position in the Gulf of Maine. And as you can see here, with some wandering, it started to be more frequent 
in the Gulf of Maine. Again, we as scientists, we do a variability all the time, okay? So we're, we're just communicating that this amount of variability is really been unseen in the last 50 years. And we're seeing the Labrador current water not present as much as we used to see it in the Gulf of Maine. So what this means in conclusion, you've heard from our friends at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, that the Gulf of Maine is the world's most rapidly warming enclosed body of water in the world. And this is part of the reason why, is the dynamic and changing of those two currents. So when those currents start to change, things start to move. And this one has moved like no one has ever seen before. These are spiny dogfish sharks. They used to be an endangered species, or shall we say, threatened. And now they have invaded the Gulf of Maine like a plague of locusts, like nobody has ever seen before. We are loaded with this species. They have replaced many, much of our previous fishes in the Gulf of Maine. So we did a study at the University of New England's Marine Science Center and we estimated that the, in the species, uh, the male to female ratio that we were seeing out there, there was four males for every one female. And we found out that the, the amount of females that we had estimated in 1999 was about 52,000 metric tons in the Gulf of Maine. Well, this year, we found that they're not only down at the bottom. We've set nets throughout the water column in the Gulf of Maine. And we found that spiny dogfish sharks are just not bottom species. They're occupying the whole water column. So we've revised our estimates to upwards of 230,000 metric tons at any one time. At four to, I'm sorry, that's the spot, that's the females. If you take four to one, at any one time, the standing stock biomass of, of, of these spiny dogfish is 800,000 metric tons. Remember the figure that I gave you back there from the cod and haddock in the Barents Sea? That was one million metric tons. This is a, an extraordinary amount of biomass. If you estimate the total amount of cod right now in the Gulf of Maine, it's 10,000 metric tons. They can't survive. They can't survive. They're being eaten completely. This is, again, like a load of, of, of locusts that is eating everything in the Gulf of Maine, okay? Now, at any one time, we could just sort of say, uh, give up. But then we found out, as we started going to Europe, that this was the number one fish and chips in the UK. They called it rock salmon. And it's widely appreciated all over Europe as the, the most preferred fish and chips of any other fish. OK, so how about in that direction? We can give them spiny dogfish if we can work on the legal and regulatory and with the changes in the fishing community. This is not easy for our fishing community. They're going through massive changes, not only what they've gone through in the regulatory side, but what they're going through in a trying to adapt to climate change. Okay, and then the kicker is China. So again, I mentioned most of the world's population is now and will be far into the future in China and Africa. When many of us were in Iceland just a few months before, the Chinese prime minister, remember Iceland is only 300,000 people, you know, China is a billion people, and the Chinese prime minister made a special trip to Reykjavik to shake hands over fish. Because remember, they eat 150 pounds per capita per year times one billion people, their major source is not terrestrial protein, it's aquatic or seafood protein. So there's the, the markets that are going out of this area. So there's going to be competition, economic competition for this new protein source, but also massive amounts of possibilities for cooperation in China. Last week, Dean Stephen Gaines from the University of California, Santa Barbara gave a talk at the University of New England. And he said that his institute, the Marine Science Institute, was creating another marine science institute in China. And they were hiring 100 faculty members in fisheries in marine science. Because China 
for all, all of what you've heard, knows that they have big environmental problems. And so this next generation in this audience is going to have lots and lots of opportunities to work globally in issues like we're talking about, to be exposed from local to global. OK, let me start wrapping up. So this is Bob Myers. And you see we were both flooded with this. Because sustainability science is, is really where this is at. Sustainability as defined by this giant challenge, but the five great issues of our day. Food, energy, water, waste, and shelter. So there are universities, institutes, places all over the world now that are no longer departments of biology or chemistry. They're departments of energy and food, food systems, et cetera. So what we've decided to then birth at the University of New England is a whole new program on aquatic foods ecosystems, where our students will get from port to plate or from farm to fork in both of these. And they won't be removed from all of the value chain and other local to global issues that I've talked about tonight. OK, wrapping up. If we think that we're going to be able to sustain 10 to 12 billion souls on this planet from the land of the planet, or what we call the terrestrial part of the planet, we're terribly wrong. Because if you look at all, and there's just some of these, just look through it. I'm not going to read or go through these with you. We have a lot of challenges with providing food for a hungry world from the terrestrial sphere of the planet. There's lots of really great work in this area, but there's a big, big question. If most of the world's people are going to be wanting seafood and not terrestrial food, we're going to have a lot of problems. So right today, I'm going to leave you with this, these couple of comments. The ocean today only produces 1 to 4% of all the human foods of the planet. 1 to 4%. We have a tremendous opportunity to restore fisheries, to come up with sustainable farming systems, and sea vegetables, the remarkable seaweeds and main seaweed economy that we're seeing booming right now. We can lead all of this. All of those products that I've just mentioned have magic substances for human health and wellness. So. What happens if we don't do this? What happens if we continue along our, what I think is an unethical pathway, and we continue to support ourselves off of imported seafood from other places, and we continue to think that we can support the future people of this planet, the hungry people, off the terrestrial sphere alone? Then this is the consequence that we will suffer. We will destroy all of the Amazon. We will destroy the Great Taiga Forest, the Serengetis. We will destroy every single national park and protected area of this planet that we care deeply about by agriculture for dire human needs. We cannot depend upon the terrestrial sphere of this planet to support the people of the future world. Thank you very much. We'll now take some audience questions. We have a microphone here. And also on the other side, my colleague Sarah is going to work a microphone. We're going to start with a question right here from one of our regulars. Here you go, ma'am. Uh, thank you. This was uh, incredibly informative, very interesting. I have two questions. So. If you listen to uh, vegans, who are, of course, very concerned yes. about the, the, the uh, feeding of our uh, current and future world population, um, they are not necessarily talking, or they are not specifically talking about aquatic foods, yes. except for the, the uh, vegetables, yes. the sea vegetables. <clears throat> Is it true, then, uh, what I, I think I'm hearing from your talk, that uh, 
probably one of our most promising alternatives is not uh, going vegan, which requires a lot of, of land in production uh, for grains, but would be uh, to, in fact, uh, use seafood in our, our diet. Uh, that's my first question. My second question is, are the Chinese interested in our spiny dogfish? The latter one is yes, they are. I um, mean, it, it is a, a flaky white fish. Uh, those of you who have tried it, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute has had a number of sort of seafood tasting events around in our community. It, it, it is, it's a beautiful, again, boneless, white, tasty flesh fish that's similar to tilapia cod, haddock, uh, catfish, uh, can be breaded in that way, easily prepared. So yes, they're very interested. Um, both the pangasius or catfish fisheries as well as the tilapia aquaculture is, very, is quite unsustainable right now and causes a huge environmental disruption in Vietnam and China. So yes, they're interested. You know, anybody who's done uh, a life cycle assessment of, of vegan, of that type of diet, knows, knows very deeply that that is a good choice that uh, a vegan diet would have a much lower footprint on the planet in terms of resource use. The, I think the, the big problem that we face is accessing industrial farms for soybeans where if the world did decide to go vegan, I'm very concerned about uh, the destruction of, of the Brazilian and Argentina's pampas by soybean farming. That has been, soybeans have been, you know, that increased consumption, mostly in Asia, has driven that environmental destruction in South America, and I fear would drive it in Africa. Uh, could you talk about, yeah, it's on. is it on? Okay. Uh, could you uh, talk about some solutions that are, um, some progress that's being made in terms of desalinization of the ocean, of the dead zones yeah. of the ocean, yeah. the pollution in the ocean? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, probably the biggest issue that a lot of us are dealing with is the eutrophication or, or the, the nitrification of the planet, particularly the coastal areas of the world, which is, Yes, CO2 is causing acidification of, of, the, of the ocean, we know that, but really in the coastal areas, the major concern for acidification is too much nitrogen, is nitrogen being released from our watersheds. And that's multiple, multiple sources. That's from all of us sort of over fertilizing, or if you do that, it's also from you know, sewage treatment uh, discharges from sewage treatment plants. Um, I can say that there is a lot of really exciting work to keep that nitrogen on land. And, but it's, it's not at an industrial scale right now. We, we desperately need to turn our sewage treatment plants you know, into more uh, production centers. We need to turn the pipe around. In Southern California, they did a great job of this. So they, uh, they have a, a number of, of tertiary treated plants which all of the, of the highways and the, water, uh, the, the, the roadways uh, along the highways of Southern California are all irrigated now with tertiary treated water. And they have a whole legal and regulatory framework that, makes, that gives an incentive to do that. So there, there's a, uh, also people now putting tertiary treated water in reservoirs, okay, and keeping that for a certain period of time treating it and re bringing that water back into the drinking water system. We desperately need to get beyond this, the, that the ocean is, the, is a receptacle for our, our, our wastes. Um, progress can be made, for example, with, with sea vegetables. We know that kelp uh, and restoring kelp forests and restoring sea grasses, restoring eel grasses, that can have a tremendous beneficial effect to the absorption of not only nitrogen, but CO2. So any programs like that uh, would be very beneficial. And there are lots of really good programs. I think we have a question here in back. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm an um, economics major at USM, actually. So this is really exciting, all the different 
prospects it's going to bring to the state. But I wanted to ask about um, aquaculture specifically, salmon aquaculture. My understanding was that there are significant risks in like the inputs, the waste outputs, and um, threats to the genetic stock of wild salmon. But um, it sounds like there are ways to meaningfully mitigate those sorts of risks. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. You know, the, the entire history of salmon farming in the world is within the lifespan of the person speaking to you right now. So the first farm salmon reached the market when I was a graduate student. So it's really that new. And so uh, a lot of the concerns that we all had uh, back in the scientists had and the public had uh, in the 70s and 80s have really been turned around. And uh, like, for example, right now, um, there's all, almost all of Norwegian salmon farms do not use any antibiotics anymore. Uh, all of the feeds don't necessarily need to come from the ocean anymore. So there's been huge amounts of advances in the feeds and in wastes. Uh, a lot of the visual impacts of salmon farming, um, people used to be very concerned that their real estate value would go down if they had to look at a salmon farm. Well, now a lot of it is submerged technologies. So all you really see is a buoy at the surface. So some of the, you know, the older salmon farms, they're still there. Some of them still, they're transiting still. But you know, in the future, if you look at all of the efficiencies of chicken, beef, pork, you know, any terrestrial protein, because they're all having to be in, on, in the air just supporting themselves with, you know, against gravity. So their meat to bone ratio is so much lower. They have to have many more bones. And so they don't grow as fast. They don't put on as any meat as fast. So water, growing food in water is just intuitively a much, much more efficient. So we're working on it. It's been, again, since I think the first farm salmon was 1974, 75, 76. And now if you, you know, look at it clearly, what's the latest technologies? You know, we can do this. We can do it sustainably, too. Yes. I have a question. Oh, um, what, is the, what is the current status of commercial uh, fishing for spiny dogfish in the Gulf of Maine? Not good. Not good because the uh, regulatory regime um, is still in, well, I wouldn't even call it in flux. It's, it's pretty much stuck. Um, there's very strong catch limits on spiny dogfish. Uh, fishermen are resistant to catching them because of uh, the current status of their, their gear. Um, and the prices are quite low. Uh, but in each one of those cases, every, there's people working on it. There's people on incre uh, working to increase the market value. There's people working to create uh, better gear that doesn't get ripped up by these, these fish. And there's people working on improving the allocations, the catch allocations per, per fishing uh, trip. Right here. I was just wondering, I'm Norwegian, and it was very nice to see you speak so highly of their fishing. But I was very interested in the fish that now is in the Gulf of Maine. Couldn't they go to the UK and see how they are fishing it and improve the fishing gear here? Yes. You, you absolutely nailed it. I mean, in this cooperation, um, you know, Sintef in Norway or the University of Tromsø or all of the great Norwegian fishing companies and universities and industries. If we combine that with Iceland and the technologies they have, it would be very, very powerful in, to get technology transfer and international training and cooperation accelerated between our countries. Our, our fishermen here who are going to have to adapt to this changing world really need that level of cooperation. OK, sure. Tom. Uh, thank you. That was very enlightening and uplifting. Oh, uh, good. But uh, with the spiny dogfish, are those within the territorial waters of the United States? Or is this going to be a resource that we will see other countries come in 
and take advantage of before we kind of get up to speed and can use it to our own advantage? Yeah, it's mostly a U.S. resource from concentrated really from North Carolina to southern New England right now. We do see them moving into the Gulf of Maine, but it is a, it's a U.S. resource. The Canadians have a black dogfish. They have other species, but they don't really utilize them that much. I was just wondering, at the beginning of your talk, uh, you mentioned um, indigenous populations being uh, in control of a lot of the Arctic area. And, and I just wanted to know, um, you know, do they have a seat at the table? I'm, I'm hearing about Russia, United States, Canada, Norway. Um, uh, I'm just, you know, there's a history of just being pushed aside um, and uh, um, just Wanted to know your thoughts on where that's going. Yeah, so you know they they are demanding a seat at the table. So, you know, at the Arctic Circle Assembly, they were uh, prominently represented and I think heard by the Arctic nations. So a lot of the conventions, uh, the the High Arctic actually now has been closed to fishing because we really don't even, don't even know what's there. So they've been very actively involved in the discussions about a new international convention that would include them, that would preserve uh, the Arctic in a convention similar to the Ar Antarctic Convention. Yeah, they're, they're there at the table and are a strong voice. Thanks for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, OK, I'd like to thank Barry Costa-Pierce for a wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you.